Chapter 3 Fortitude The Testimony of Ansith Hades Third Statement Much has happened, and my time is short, so I shall keep these words brief. Yet they dare not falter in this duty, lest I lose the courage to continue. To denounce oneself is a somber disposition, but to denounce the world and wonders that have shaped one's soul is a thousand times worse. I would gladly give my life in the God Emperor's service, but what if that service demands the death of a planet and its people? What if my testament brings down a decree of exterminatus upon the candle world? Let the little tyrants come try their luck. The darkness here is more malign than I feared, and much stronger. A grievous blasphemy has been wrought upon the ship's soul, the kind that stems from calculated heresy rather than blind folly. Someone or something, or more likely someone enslaved to something unholy, is at work upon the world, actively unraveling the ties that bind its people to sense and sanity. I have no not what end, nor how widespread the corruption runs, but I believe there is still time to avert the coming catastrophe, for that is surely why I was compelled to return here. There must be his purpose for me. And so my confession truly begins. For I am several shouted slave. It was not simultaneously that drew me back to the candle world, but a dream. It first came to me a little over a year ago, left me since. There was no discernible trigger to its evident, yet I have never doubted its import for it. Has a crystalline lucidity that ellipses my waking life, as if a dream and reality had become inverted. The form it takes is constant and minimal. I walk an unwinding path of congealed darkness, ascending through a white vacuum so empty it could sustain neither sight nor sound. The ground feels like polished glass beneath my bare feet, ice cold and treacherous compelling me to tread with caution. The air is so lifeless, it may not be there at all. Yet its absence does not trouble my lungs. I have been on this road forever and can envision to no end to it. But I, I cannot, must not, pause even a moment, for I am not alone in this nothingness. Something has been following me from the beginning that has never was mirroring my every step but eager to close the gap. It is hunger beyond imagining, and the one dreadful variable in the limbo is the distance between us. Should I falter, my shadow will gain ground on me. Yet no matter how absurd I focus, the abyss eventually dulls my senses, and I stumble on the road. Though I, uh, only once or twice in each dream, Every mistake persists into the next night, swelling my lapse. And so, night by night, my stalker draws ever closer. Catch you if I can, catch me if you can't. I know what must, what manner of intuity pursues me. Save that it's malevolent, whatever. I glance around, the road is empty, yet I know something is there because I feel its hunger like a full radiance upon my back. It is real. It is coming for me, and if, if it overtakes me, I shall lose more than my life, for it is not mere flesh and blood that it craves. Such sweet puppets to play and play upon, but oh, so frail and fleeting. There was one hope in the creeping oblivion, a distant light on the path ahead, like my stalker. It is something I sense rather than see, for it shines invisibly and undoubtedly. The two phantoms are anithical fates entwined, salvation and damnation vying for the eternal soul, and throw that prize for something far greater, 
Does that make you the lock or the key, dear sister? I know I must reach light before my shadow claims me, but neither haste nor endurance will carry me any closer to that blessed beacon, for it is not distance that divides us. Like the rite of crossing, the road of redemption lies within, where all true emphasis is reside. And in my heart I recognize the light as a second flame atop the Ferulian, and understand that my salvation lies on the candle world. It always has, answered Whispered, but I was too prideful to see it. She closed the journal once again, resisting the compulsion to read her words. Her path lay ahead. As in the dream, she had to keep moving forwards until she found an answer. For now her place was with her belligerent charges in the infirmary. Somewhat to her surprise, Celestine Superior Sifona had granted her leave to go about her business freely. Unlike the prideful Camille, the Castellan commander had treated her with courtesy, if not quite respect. Respect must be earned, Ansnith decided herself. I shall not disappoint her. After the horror of the chapel, she had no desire to linger in her chamber. But it wasn't just the journal that had drawn her here. She rose and crossed through the thunk beside her bed. Her fingers spun the wheels of its coated latch until it clicked free. Heaving the lid open, she rummaged beneath the neatly folded garments within until she found a gilded metal case. Her hands trembled as she drew it out. I have no choice, she told herself. Inside the case nestled upon the bed a red, red velvet lay a bolt pistol and a single ammo clip. The weapon's elegantly contoured form was decorated with silver fili of thorns that wound about the barrel like a living plant. Tiny roses fawn from crushed rubies glittered among the tangle-like specks of blood. Along with her scars, this weapon was all that remained of her second life. She is called Tracy. Father Deliverance says tenderly. It means sorrow, for that is what she promises those who defy the God Emperor's will. She is a relic from the Thorn Eternal, gifted to me by our fearsome sister, the Canoness Excusiant. He smiles ruefully. But I am no warrior, so I in turn pass her on to you, my vigilant paladin. They're all alone in his chamber, aboard the Crusade's flagship, a situation that would be unthinkable with any other man. The room is artistically flourished, like the cell of a common monk, for Father Deliverance believes that comfort encourages souls to clave too evadely to their mortal shells. Does she please you? He asks solemnly. She is beautiful, Anseth replies, her voice filled with awe as she studies the exquisite weapon. She has only just entered the confessor's service, and his force is still en route to the destination with many weeks of travel ahead. She had no opportunity to prove herself, yet he has already named her his personal champion. Elevating her above the Castellans of the Thorn Eternal, who have fought beside him for years. And now this. I am unworthy, your reverence, she says. It takes every shred of her will to admit that and prefer the weapon to him. If you are unworthy, then so am I. For I have chosen you from among countless others, as of Hades. Father Deliverance places a hand on her shoulder. Do you believe I am unworthy, my sister? We are all unworthy, Anseth answered. All save the rest present angels, which is why they renounced us. She took the gun from its case, and her finger slipped beneath the trigger guard with easy familiarity. 
As if she had never forsworn the weapon, Tracy is shown in her grip, eager to make her the agent of its justice once more. Anthor shouldered, shuddered, as a thrill of rapture ran through her body. It felt like a betrayal, the exchange of the beloved gift for a hated one. But against the corruption stalking their vessel, a gun would be more persistent than a quill. It would be folly to spurn such a weapon now. Besides, the darkness had already destroyed her canonist's gift. Ansa snapped the ammo clip into place and slid the pistol into her medicaid bag. The act felt symbolic. Had she taken a step closer to the twisted pedagogue of mercy, she had seen in the chapel. She had my face. No, no, Ansa promised herself as she headed for the door. I will die before I embrace her. Platoon Dark Star Red, you are clear to disembark. The dropship's pilot, Vox. Commence breach, Asher. Blood tight, Tolan Fitz yelled as he threw the hatch open and leapt from the hovering vessel, his bolt pistol braced against his armored chest. He landed hard in the Xeno structure below, and the ground creaked hollowly underneath the impact. Visit glanced down and saw lassured wooden tiles beneath his bare feet. He blinked in confusion, and reality twisted back into shape, revealing his iron-sawed boots and the white crystal skin of an utterly alien realm. The translucent substance underfoot was threaded with silver filaments that pulsed with blue light. It's alive, Fizzit thought with disgust. The whole damn place is alive. As his fellow breachers studded down around him, he surveyed the glittering landscape ahead. From a distance, the Xenos anomaly had looked like a silvery bell hanging in space, but up close it was more like a spherical web of spun glass. Its strands coiled about one another, spiraling up and down through the structure in a labyrinth of connected pathways. There were no straight lines or hard angles, and everything appeared to be formed from the same lining crystal like the place had been woven or grown. At the spire's periphery, where Dark Star Company had deployed, the strands merged into broad furtclicks. But further in the branched repeatery, narrowing with every division, towards the core of the breaches, would have proceeded in single fire. Visit gauged that wasn't great, but it was no difficult to the cramped corridors and tunnels they had navigated elsewhere. Wrong, he corrected himself with a chill of foreboding. This isn't like anything we've seen before. Numbering the atmosphere, breach, Sergeant. Specialist Schrodinger voxed over the platoon's channel. It's cold as locksteel blood, but breathable. Doesn't matter, Fizzit replied eyeing the black nothingness between the strands. There were no walls or energy shields holding back the void. At least none their eyes or sensors could detect. Yet there was gravity here, so maybe there was breathable air too. But only a fool would trust it. We stay void sealed, brothers. Repeat, void sealed. His helmet vox pinged back acknowledgments from the other platoon leaders, including Captain Forsey, who was leading the force deployed on the far side of the sphere. Divisions like this were really the captains to make, but as always, he had deferred to visit in the field. Things always went more smoothly that way, even if their bloody commissar didn't like it. As usual, Lumshe was tagging along with Fizit's platoon, tactically marking it as the weakest link in the company's chain. The commissar's scarlet-striped compass armor was still... was a stain on the Dark Star's red pride. But Fizzit couldn't afford to think about that right now. With luck, their shadow wouldn't make it out of this mission alive. Form up around me, brothers, Fizzit ordered, 
as the last of his platoon landed, and the drop poor ship roared away. Stranded wedge, Sancto. I want that bruiser live. Already on it, chief. The blast trooper walks back. This is an unholy damnation, Savardi said, his voice filled with superstitious awe. We should have purged it from space comrades. Though he was standing beside Vizit, their airtight armor muted regular speech. When a breacher was void-sealed, his vox and air tank strapped to his back were his lifelines. Reckon a couple old plasma missiles would bring the whole place down, Scanto said as he finished setting up the platoon's tripod-mounted heavy bolter. We gotta make a few cracks to get things started. Could never tell with Zeno's tech, though. Schrodinger cautioned. Always tougher than it looks. That ain't the mission anyways, Fizzit said. We go in, brothers. I know it, chief, Skanto replied, slamming an ammo band into the big gun. But it don't make no sense. No, it doesn't, brother, Fizzit agreed. Listwise, not worse. Dark Star Company had been on its way up to the rest stop, the resupply at the Excorridor Orbis, when the order came in to divert their Ariskin sector for a priority mission. The mission briefing had been sketchy to the point of being non-existent, and there was talk someone high up was pulling the strings, maybe at an Inquisition level. It wouldn't be the first time. The bastards always kept to the shadows, no matter how things went down. The blind emerald-robed man who boarded their cruiser to observe had exactly the kind of shifty, aloof look about him that spelled trouble in Torzen visit book. Somebody wants a sniff at the thing's guns, he told his men. And we're the nose brothers. Always been the... Visit trailed off, frowning. The crystal vista ahead was beginning to shimmer, as though he were looking through it, a heat haze. Was there something inside it? Squinting, he made out a flickering wood-paneled corridor, superimposed over an alien world. The sight made him nauseous, as if he were being pulled inside out. You see in this dark star red? Nobody played. I said... Suddenly... Agony wrecked his stomach, tearing his words away. It felt like he had taken a bolt round to the guts. He staggered back and hit a wall. What the... Visit hissed through the pain, trying to make sense of the nonsense his eyes were feeding him. He was standing in the corridor he had glimpsed through the crystal. He swung around, but his men were gone. In their place was a dark room filled with crates. It looked like some kind of storage space. Woosley... He remembered crawling in there when the alarm had sounded. Wait, what alarm it? Fizzit thought wildly. What was this place and where was his platoon? Dark Star Red, do you read me? He called, then released his Vox. Was it also gone, along with his helmet and carapace armor? Worst of all, the only weapon he was carrying was a dagger. He raised it and saw the blade was covered in blood. His loose white coveralls were drenched in the stuff. I killed Glick, he remembered. Except Glick was already dead when I did it. No, I couldn't be right. Conrad Glick had been alive and well on the dropship just minutes ago. They checked each other's air tanks. It's this Xeno hellhole, Fizzit realized. It's messing with my head. Don't trust anything you see, brothers, he snarled in the vox that wasn't there. Enough, breach, Sergeant, Commissar Lemshire replied on a private channel. At his words, the illusionary corridor retreated like an outgoing tide, washing away his its pain and leaving the crystal world in its wake. His comrades were back, too, formed up around him with their weapons leveled at the horizon. Their faces were hidden behind tainted visors but he could imagine their strained expressions. Click, call in, Visit ordered on impulse. Breacher 8, blood tight, Conrad Glick responded. What do you see, Breach Sergeant? 
Savari asked, as he was stroking the golden aquila tapped to the breastplate. He claimed it was sinful to hide the holy icon under his armor, but they all knew the truth. Chedji's Vizzi feared it wouldn't work if he covered it up. Nothing. Moving out there now, chief, Skanto reported, swiveling his heavy weapon back and forth across the horizon. Breach Sergeant, explain yourself, Captain Foros demanded on the master channel. Vizit hesitated, noticing the Kamazar had come up alongside him. He didn't want to lie to his brothers, but the truth was liable to get him branded a crazy man in Lumshe's eyes. Or worse, a witch. Did he even believe it himself? To the void with it, he decided. Don't know what I saw, but something tried to get into my head. It knows we're here, Vizit warned broadcasting onto the company Y channel. This place, it looks quiet, but it's just plain dead. Stay sharp, brothers. This ain't going to be a clean breach. Observation noted, Sergeant, Captain Foros replied. Is your unit in position? Visit realized he hadn't confirmed his team's deployment yet. Cursing under his breath, he sent the signal. Received. Dark Star Red. The captain acknowledged. All platoons, commence phase two. Take it slow and steady, breaches. Dark Star Red, forwards. Visit, ordered. Santo, hold the extraction point. The platoon advanced in an air ahead formation, Visit taking point with 24 troopers on either side. The blast breacher, with reinforced armor and heavy stubber, marched at the tip of the each wing. Alongside a specialist equipped with an auspex, Visit knew three other platoons would be mirroring their advance from equidistant points along the perimeter, all converging on the structure's core. The ship's cogitators had estimated the sphere's diameter at a little under six miles. In theory, that wasn't much ground to cover, but there was no telling how tricky things would become once they left the rim especially if the path started corkscrewing up and down through the anomaly. Somehow, if it doubted, it was going to be that easy. No, it's going to be a bloody meat grinder. The conviction hit him with such force that he faltered in his advance. It wasn't a gut feeling. It was hard knowledge. Most of the men who entered this labyrinth wouldn't be coming out again. Got to turn them around before it happens. Again? He thought. Again. The ground ahead was already beginning to fray into a multitude of strands. He'd have to split up the platooning soon, send squads along different paths and hope somebody would find a way to the core. Nobody ever will, he predicted, or remembered. Very soon now, when they were all hopelessly lost in the maze, the crystal would start to sing and then razor lights would come for them. Razor lights? Fizzit frowned, trying to identify the word. He felt... No. It meant something terrible, but the shape behind it eluded him. Breach Sergeant, why have you halted? Lemshre demanded. Razor, Fizzit began to say. Something hit him with a startling force. He glanced down and saw an iron bolt jutting from his left shoulder. But the pain it brought was nothing besides the resident agony in his belly. I warned you to stand down, off-worlder, someone shouted. Fizzit looked up in confusion. He was back in the phantom corridor, but this time he wasn't alone. A shaven-headed man in grey tunic was yelling at him, brandishing a short sword. Beside the swordsman, a woman in the same uniform was reloading her crossbow. Kinderworlds, he remembered, barely, as he yanked the bolt from his shoulder. Drop your weapon and get to your knees, the man yelled. Now! Without a moment's hesitation, Visit charged them, his dagger raised, her eyes widening with panic. The woman fired off a hasty second shot. Visit tried to dodge it aside, but his reflexes were sluggish, and her bolt sliced his left cheek open. 
As she fumbled for another bolt, Fizzit slammed into her like a wrecking ball, throwing her from her feet so hard her head cracked against the floor. In the same instant, he parried the hack from the sword with his dagger. The longer blade scraped along his own until it snagged in the weapon's upward curved hilt. With a snarl, Fizzit twisted the sword from the candle world's grip and slammed his fist into his face. I shouldn't be here, he roared. One punch was more than enough to stun the man. But Fizzit followed up. Anyway, furious that the scum had ripped him away from his platoon. His third punch broke the man's neck with an audible snap. The candle world fell, his legs kicking spasmically. Fizzit glanced at the weapon. But she was out cold. Take me back, he bellowed at the world, closing his eyes. But when he opened them again, he was still in the corridor. Take me back, you bastard! But the world wasn't listening. Thunder rumbled somewhere overhead, barely muffled by the wooden walls. It brought memories flooding back, though he had no idea whether they were real or not. He was on an ocean-bound ship, a heretic ship, that was fearing him towards a lie and he wasn't alone. His brothers were somewhere. What was left of them, at least. Why had he abandoned them? The fly, Fizzit remembered, with loathing. Had to kill the fly. It had lured him away from the infirmary after he had taken down the rotting puppet. Poor twice-dead Click had looked like he had been moldering for days. His milky white eyes sunk deep into the ruins of his face. The walking corpse hadn't fought back when Visit hackled it apart, but the fly had buzzed around them excitedly, as if enjoying the show. Afterwards, it haunted through the ship, driven by the absolute certainty he had to kill it. But the little bastard had always stayed just out of reach, drawing him on, taunting him. Somewhere along his way, his memories trailed off into darkness. Visit slammed his fist into the wall, splintering the wood. Have to get back, he rasped. Warn them. Warn who? A proud platoon about to enter the razor's nest for the wrangled ghost that came out on the other side. How could both be real? His head was pounding, his thoughts strangled by fever and pain as he tried to untangle them, a candle world charged around the corner. Seeing his fallen comrades, the guard skidded to a halt and raised his crossbow. Fizzit hurled his dagger, and the man screamed as it slammed into his chest. Too many of them, Fizzit guessed, as he strode unsteadily toward his dying foe and tugged his blade free. I need my brothers. Yes, that made sense. Together they can capture this ghost ship and turn it around, maybe even find a way back to the crystal death trap before the razor's lights woke up. Fizzit hesitated, realizing he had no idea where the infirmary was. How big could this place be? Ah, fraggit, he muttered, choosing a direction at random. Fizzit staggered along the swaying corridor. Jonah contemplated his prayer of warding and affixed a scroll of citation to the chapel doors. The portals had already been welded shut and reinforced with iron crossbars, but such mundane precautions wouldn't hold back the vermin of the warp if they tried to break through. Though the distracted altar had been destroyed, the sacrilege would shine darkly in the sea of souls, acting as a beacon for unmistakable things. If they did come, only faith or fire would deter them, Sister Giri and her thrice-blessed flamer would provide the fire should the articles of Jonah's faith prove wanting. But he doubted it would come to that, though he didn't believe a word of the Imperial Creed. His prayers and wards always carried weight. It wasn't dogma that empowered such things, but conviction. And Jonah Tithe's conviction had hardened to stone over the years, even if it wasn't the kind most throne-fearing folk would recognize. Don't touch the door, sister, he cautioned with arm and woman beside him, no matter what you hear within. 
Sister Givney nodded, her expression serene. Citizen Superior Zephona had warned Jonah that the fifth member of her squad was bound by a vow of silence. She would only break in dire emergency. The flame archon branded beneath Givney's eye, eye marked her as a citizen Ignis, a warrior who was revered the cleansing properties of fire above all others. She had certainly applied her passion superficially in the chapel when she burned the corpses of the monks, showing no hint of disgust at the stench or charred flesh. To his surprise, Jonah found her a little unsettling. She reminds me of you, Mina, he thought. Despite her flawless ebony complexion, there was a fray quality about Givene that was uncannily reminiscent of his pale sister. Of course, Mina would be much older than this woman now. He realized he was staring at the silent warrior. I leave this burden in your care, Vidlin Castellan, he said, offering a blessing. May the god emperor ward you during your vigil. But don't count on it, Jonah thought as he walked away. He didn't believe the Imperium's distant god gave a damn about his subjects. More to the point, he was pretty sure the ancient Faudster was long dead, even if his great con of humanity was still running strong. The heretical book Jonah had stolen was right. Only a fool would swallow the lies proclaiming mankind's manifest destiny, or any other higher purpose for that matter. The only truths were the ones men and women wrought themselves and even the finest were etched in sand. Did you ever believe in our own lies? Jonah asked the corpse god. He professed to serve. He doubted anybody knew the answer, or would ever at least of all the zealots of the ecclesiarchy. But you talk a good game, brothers, Jonah admitted, as he climbed the staircase, heading for the infirmary. Sister Ansnith, had asked him to address her penance, perhaps steady their nerves with a sermon and a few blessings. It was the kind of thing that he could do in his sleep now, but rousing words could work miracles upon common men. That was how the Imperium duped millions into pointless deaths every day. And so it goes, he brooded, round and round, but always down. He turned a corner and collided with the monster. The brute towered over him, its misshapen, muscle-bound torso spattered with gore. Bloodshot eyes glared at him from the cracky face that mirrored his surprise. Before Jonah could retreat, the stranger grabbed his robe and yanked him forwards, bringing him to his face. You want to live, priest? The beast growled, pressing a dagger to his throat. I'm not afraid to die, Jonah answered, thinking fast as he weighed up his center. The attacker was wearing dirty white overalls. Despite its twisted form, it was a man, the missing guardsman. But you don't want to kill me, soldier. Don't I? The trooper's breath stank of decay. He's sick, Jonah gorged, almost dead on his feet. Tell me why I don't, priest. We're both strangers here, Jonah said, looking for an angle. He had played this carefully. There was a predatory sharpness about this man. That sickness had it blunted. If anything, it made him more dangerous. Jonah said it on paranoia. There's something unholy on this vessel, soldier. You can both feel it. Yeah, you're wrong there, the guardsman rasped. I am here to destroy it. Jonah urged, putting steel to his voice. Inspiration struck him. I am working with Sister Ansnith. For a moment, his captor looked uncertain. Then he pressed the blade closer. Need to free my men. He broke into a heckling cough, but his knife didn't waver. Lost. Gavine. Way back. I know the way, Jonah promised. We'll go together, friend. It was all he could think of. The body must be burned without delay, Ansteth declared, 
stepping away from the corpse on the infirmary floor. It was already beginning to liquefy under its coverings, and the stench was nauseating, but that was the least of her concerns. The rate of putrefaction was unprecedented in her experience, unnatural. The guardsmen gathered around her were silent, watching her every move with haunted eyes. They looked like they aged ten years since the last time they saw them. All their bravado gone. Only their commissar appeared unfectured. In Kathu, Lumshe, had donned his full dress regala and attached to his prosthetic leg, making himself an exemplar of the order among the lost souls he shepherded. For once, Ansonis was grateful for his princes. Is this to be our fate too, blessed sister? Zavari asked, giving voice to the fear in all their hearts. Was it already happening? The healers of the bronze candle are among the finest in the Imperium, and Sith assured him. They will aid us. We cannot stay here. Horka croaked through his bruised throat. Not here. The orc's right, sister, Santa said. You gotta move us. This, this place ain't clean. There are flies, Horka added, spitting in disgust. You are mistaken, trooper, Lumshre said. Zero no flies here. I heard them too, Kamaza, Scanto pressed. Been buzzing around by bonk all night. As if something unspoken barrier had been broken, more men piped up, their voices rising into unruly clamor. The Kamazar wrapped his cane on the ground. There are no flies! Silence fell over the room. The troopers eyed each other wearily, waiting for someone to deny it. I will sour the air with scented incense, Innsnith promised. And I have asked the priest to bless the infirmary. He will be with us shortly. She had seen no flies herself. But these men undoubtedly believed in the vermin. That was dangerous enough. You have our thanks, good sister, Lamshe said, then pointed his cane at the cadaver. Santo Horka, bear our fallen comrade from the infirmary, says Ansnith will see that you are granted passage. I ain't touching it, Santo muttered, backing away from the corpse. Horka nodded in mute agreement, his eyes wide. We will incinerate the remains here, Anson said quickly, seeing the flash of fury in the commissar's eyes. It would be unwise to push these men right now. Besides, the corpse would likely disintegrate if they attempt to move it. Sister Indrik, she called to the guard. I require your assistance. The imposing battle sister appeared in the doorway. He melt a gun covering the room. I cannot leave my post, she rumbled from behind her visor. As you are aware, the Castellan Superior has granted me authority over this matter, Ansif said lively. I will vouch for the honor of these men. They will not attempt to leave. Am I correct, Hamazal Amshe? Absolutely, he replied. We are all comrades here, Sister Indrik. He turned to Rez. Lieutenant, move the troops back. Please, sister. Anseth urged the Castellan as the men shuffled towards the rear of the room. This must be done now, lest the taint spread further. The warrior hesitated a moment, then strode towards her. Why does she always keep her face covered? Anseth wondered. What is she hiding under there? Nothing felt right about her candle world anymore. Wherever she turned, she sent secrets, lies, and the promise of corruption. Indrik knelt with unexpected grace, angling her gun to avoid burning through the floor. With a bright flash and a whoosh of superheated air, the corpse was reduced to a pile of oxidized bones and ashes. Lose the Malta, a harsh voice shouted. And Seth looked up. Tolan Fizit was standing in the doorway, one arm wrapped around Jonah Tithe, a dagger pressed to his throat. Do it now, or I will send the priest to the void. It's full of flies, Fizzit thought, staring at the infirmary in revulsion. 
Insects were filting about everywhere, swarming over the bed bound, wounded in great black clusters, even crawling over some of the able bodied men, but nobody seemed to care. His brother's face had registered surprise, relief, joy, confusion, all of it for him. But not the disgust that should be there. Nobody else can see them, Visit realized. That was why the first fly had tricked him away. The queen fly. She snaked back here and multiplied unseen, leeching off his brothers while he couldn't protect them, bleeding them dry, body and soul. Toland! It was Sister Darkstar. She had stepped in front of the armored woman with a melting gun, her arms raised. You must let the priest go. Tell her. Drop. Gun! Visit shook his head violently, fighting to find the words, let alone put them together. The sibilant droning the scuttling in the room was like an orchestral vision of the first fly's earlier solo. It was gnawing at his mind, chewing up his thoughts before they could even harden. You're seeing things, aren't you? Answer said, approaching slowly. Flies! See flies! But not around you, he noticed. No, they kept well away from Sister Darkstar. What you're seeing isn't real, Toland. Not real? Visit echoed, staring past her at the swarming insects. I've seen things too. She stopped a few paces away. Terrible things. Flies. Worse than flies, as I've said sincerely. But none of it is real. You're wrong. Physic gritted his teeth as a new sound cut through the insects. Racket. It was a disconnect. Jagged glass kneading. Like a laminate of something too broken to exist. A glimmer of indigo light flickered into life among the men gathered at the far side of the infirmary. They're coming. He warned as a glimmer burgeoned into a flat, rapidly rotating disc of liquid crystal. It was about a yard in diameter. It's stagnant, shifting from almost too bright to look at, but nobody else could see it anyway. Like the vermin, it was invisible to everyone except him. No, not quite. The flies could see it too. They were buzzing around the disc frantically, seemingly incensed by the intrusion on their territory. Those that drew too close to its orbit combusted into a noxious green burst. Listen to me, Tornin. Whatever you're seeing, don't look at it, Ansif urged. Looking makes it real. Visitors gaze away from the conflicting nightmares he saw. Her eyes were bright with the terrible pity he had seen before. In that moment, he was quite certain she was the best and the worst of them all. Tornin. Endure. Too late, he rasped. With an electric screech, the disc soared toward him, tearing ingurably through everything except the flies, which died in droves in its wake, as it closed his eyes as it passed through the hospital and engulfed him. Say again, Dark Star Red, Captain Force Vox. Why is it too late? I am Fizith. He thought. He opened his eyes to the crystal hell and recognized the moment. Somewhere far away, he heard his knife clattering to the ground and the ghosts of future times yelling at one another. He even felt the priest break free of his hold, but he let it all fade away. Nothing in that world mattered. This was where he belonged. Well, he had been gone as brothers had continued the ill-fated advance. They were deep inside Lambeth now. Their force divided and scattered along different strands. Visit was at the head of a single squad, walking along a path so narrow that one misstep might plunge him into the void of either side. The web had just begun to trill its dark song as its pulse quickened at the intrusion. It was probably too late to change things, but he had to try anyway. All units, fall back to the perimeter, Visit broadcast, scanning the glittering web. 
Double time. Order overruled, Lambre snapped from his position behind Fizet. We will not abort the mission. I'm seeing increased activity up ahead. Lieutenant Schultz, the commander of Darkstar Blue Vox, his voice almost drowned by the squirrel of static. Visit recalled that Schlitz's squad had gone closer to the sphere's core than any others. Not one of them had made it out alive. Looks like blue lights. They're coming out of the web, moving. Schultz's signal erupted into a screech of white noise. Moments later, an eerie reverberating cacophony echoed through the labyrinth. The cough of gunfire distorted to something almost harmonic. Multiple contacts, Captain Force sent. Unidentified Xenos objects. We are engaging. They're not Xenos, Fizet thought widely. There's something much worse. Do not engage. He vox urgently. Fall back. Say again, Dark Star Red. Comes our Lumshe leveled his Lazwa pistol at Fizet. By the authority invested in me, I decree. A large disc of liquid light soared out of the web and striked towards the squad, screaming electronically as it came. As the men raised their weapons, it tore right through Breach of Humbrook as the waste and sped on, making for the crystal triangle on the far side. Blue fire and black smoke vomited from Huckenberg's wound as it yawned open, and the helpless trooper upper half toppled into the abyss. His disembodied legs remained standing, held rigid by the arcane energies crackling among them. The squad chased his killer with gunfire, but their bolt rounds exploded when they entered the disc glowing aura. It was gone in seconds, passing into the crystal skin like a ghost. The bullet shattered against the web and razor light wake, but didn't even scuff the glassy surface. We've got nothing to touch them, Fizzit yelled. Yanking Lumshay aside as another disc whirled past. That's the one that took his leg, he remembered. I changed things. Lumshay's pistol flared as he fired a skewering bolt of plasma after the retreating entity. It struck the razor's light's rim, and the thing ruptured like a miniature nova, spewing stream as a light. He never had a chance to shoot before, Fizzit realized. He can hurt them. But one gun wouldn't make a difference. Not against numbers they'd been up against soon. Visit Vox was already crackling with urgent reports from the other squads as the attack ramped up across the sphere. Kamazar, we have to go, he urged, but Lumshe could reply. A razor light surged up through the ground beneath them, tilted so it emerged edge first. The Kamazar leapt aside, but the disc sheared through his right leg, severing the limb just above the knee. Half submerged in the crystal, the thing powered along the pathway toward the rest of the squad like a spherical buzzsaw. The, the trooper behind Lamshire dodged its charge but lost his footing and tumbled into the void as the disc sped past. It rippled through the next man in line, biscuiting him from the midriff down in a spray of blood. He screamed as his body splintered under its own weight. For the Emperor! The mutilated commissar yelled, firing as he fell to the ground. His plasma blasts obliterated the razor light along with the shrieking trooper. Now, Shoida, Fizzit realized, as the charred corpse toppled into the abyss. But Shoida survived this time. Things were changing. Lumshe had lost a different leg, and a man who lived before was now dead. Pull our comrades out, breed sergeant, Lumshe ordered. Go! Fizet bellowed as his squad had hurled the commissar up. The man was barely conscious and blood was pumping from the stump of his leg. But it was just, well, there was an atmosphere here. Else such injuries would be fatal in seconds. Fizet praised the plasma pistol from the commissar's grip when hesitated. We could leave him behind this time. Hell, he could even throw the bastard into the void. I'll take him, Breach Sergeant, Gleek said, revealing him of the injured man's as if he heard Visit's train of thought. Even amid the carnage, the Doom Trooper sounded calm. It would be best if you fell here, brother, Visit thought sadly, remembering the decaying thing he hacked. What hack? Apart from the ship's infirmary. Then again, maybe Gleek's fate would change too. We lost the captain. His vox squeaked. 
Repeat, Captain forces down. All squads disengage and fall back. Visit broadcast, hurrying after Glick. The razor lights flitted about the men as they retreated through the tangle. But their movements were becoming increasingly erratic, as if they only registered their prey intermittently. Occasionally a disc would swoop towards a squad and visit would meet it with a blast of plasma. But the further his team got from the core, the less aggressive its sentinels became. What's in there? Visit muttered to himself. The question had never troubled him before, but now he couldn't let it go. He kept thinking about the blind man who had instigated this carnage. The bastard was probably monitoring things from the safety of the company's cruiser, and feared at losing his prize. What are you looking for? As they neared the perimeter, they began to run into the remnants of Dark Star Red's other squads. All had taken heavy losses, and the survivors were badly mauled. From the reports coming in, their fellow platoons hadn't fared much better, as Fizz had expected. There was no word at all from Dark Star Blue, just as before. None of Lieutenant Schultz's men would be coming back, just as before. Captain Forster had been lost, along with most of the company. What difference did I really make? Fizz had asked. His squad had got off lightly thanks to Lemtray's plasma gun, but otherwise, the massacre had played out much the same way. I didn't get cut up, Fizzit realized, hammering his fist upon the intact breastplate. The razor lights hadn't gone close to him this time, but that didn't make up for the slaughter meted out on the company. Maybe I can try again, he thought. Do it better next time. No! It was a woman, her shout coming from somewhere far away. Fizzit had exploded with pain, turning the world bright white for a heartbeat. Then he was back in the infirmary. The commissar stood before him, his face impassive as he raised the metal-tipped cane to strike again. Fly circled his high-peaked cap in an unholy halo as he mouthed words Visit couldn't hear. Sister Darkstar was stepping toward Lemshre. Her hands raised in protest as she yelled silently with the priest just behind her. Beyond them, he saw his comrades, shocked faces, including a few that hadn't been there before. But not Schrodinger. No Stefan Schrodinger was gone now. Erased from this future world like he never existed. It's all messed up, Visit thought, as the tableau played out. Everything was tinted blue and moving so slowly. It felt like every movement was strained to breaking point. as if the whole world were trying to swim upstream through a curdled river. Shouldn't be here, he said, his words disdaining into a drawn-out groan as Lumshe brought the cane down on his skull with lethargic yet savage force. Visit reeled backwards and fell, back into the razor, and over into the edge of the pathway he'd been standing on. Time snapped awake, then accelerated into a blur, hurling him to the abyss beyond the crystalline stands as he plummeted through the web, a razor light whirled past him, slicing his belly open as it whizzed by Fizit, laughed through the pain, knowing the wound would be identical to the one he had suffered before. There was no escape, and there would be no more chances. It had been too late from the start. Endure, Tulun Fizit, he had Sister Darkstar urge. No, it wasn't her voice. It wasn't any kind of voice at all, really. Though its buzzing message was unmistakable, as darkness gathered at its edges of his vision and his thoughts began to shut down, he realized it was a fly talking to him. But it was inside his helmet. Ooh, warp shenanigans as always. Oh! Okay, that was a good chapter. I'm, I'm really happy I was able to bust that one out. That was... Ooh, that was, that was a good one. A little bit of time travel shenanigans, some warp fuckery. <laughs> oh, oh. And altering the future as well by removing certain people. Holy shit. 
What's going to happen in the next chapter now that certain things have changed? Well, certain things change, but certain things remain the same. No matter how hard you try and change the past, everything in the future will always remain the same. Oh, that is such a cool thing to do with time travel. And the, the little moment where it snapped back into just modern time and he just went with it. What's going to happen next? Oh, this is so cool. All right, so that's another chapter finished for uh, Requiem Inferno. Oh, that was so cool. That was... Mm, fuck. That was awesome. All right. So as always, if you like the video, go ahead and leave a like. If you want to subscribe, go for and do that. If you want to see more videos just like this, and if you want to be continuously allowed to view these videos, go ahead and ring that bell. The little bell icon next to my little subscriber thing. You know the thing. I don't really have anything that you can actually follow along with besides Twitter and maybe a deviant art where it's just me drawing, like, not safe for work stuff that I get paid to draw because I also do commission art. If you couldn't tell from some of the things I do in the background. <clears throat> Also, let's say thank you to Mr. Costman, one of my f favorite Patreon supporters, who's been following and giving us much-needed support for the channel for the past, I think it was five months now. I think it's five months uh, the, as a recording of this video. And uh, if you want to be a Patreon supporter, go ahead and follow the link down below, which is in the description along with the secret message I leave down there in every video. Well, starting from this point anyways. Or was it? You might have to go back and check those descriptions. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. I don't leave any messages, but if you fell for it, that's kind of funny. Anyways, I've been me, you've been you, and thank you for following along with another great video. I'll see you with the next one. Bye-bye.